Our guest today is Michael Feinberg, co-founder of the Knowledge is Power program, KIPP Foundation. He launched KIPP in 1994 with his partner Dave Levin. Today, almost 20 years later, it has grown into a network of 141 high-performing schools in 20 states all over the U.S. The network serves more than 50,000 students, most of whom are from low-income African-American or Latino families. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Now, before you started KIPP, you taught third grade, uh, fifth grade for three years mm -hmm. as part of the Teach for America program. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell me the story of your first teaching experience and how that led to the creation of KIPP? Sure. Actually, I uh, taught fifth grade for two years before starting oh. the Knowledge is Power program in okay. our third year. Uh, we were uh, 19. We were both 1992 Teach for America Corps members, placed in Houston, and I was a fifth grade bilingual teacher, teaching bilingual because I had a pulse. <laughs> um, uh, there was such a shortage at the time. Dave was on another part of town teaching upper elementary as well, and like all first year teachers, we were horrible teachers. In fact, I think that we probably gave everyone a run for the money for being the worst of the horrible teachers. Um, we latched on to master teachers. We learned how to teach. You learn how to teach with apprenticeship. The end of our first year, we thought we we're doing a pretty good job with our kids. They love learning. They came excited about school and wanted to go to college and have a career. We very naively thought we've done it. On the K-12 assembly line, we gave our kids a great fifth grade year, up to go on to bigger and better in middle school. And that naive bubble burst about the second week into our second year of teaching when we watched our former kids start to just utterly fail mm -hmm. and have the wheels come off in middle school. And they were skipping school and joining gangs and doing drugs and becoming parents at alarming rates. And at first, it was easy to blame the other schools and teachers. And one night in late 1993, we had this epiphany that all that finger pointing was adding to the problem, not contributing to a solution. So we looked in the mirror, we pointed the finger at ourselves. We stayed up all night, pouring our feelings of failure and frustration on the computer screen, Watch, uh, had U2 Octung Baby playing on repeat play. And by about 5 o'clock in the morning, we had the Knowledge is Power program KIPP on the computer screen. And the premise of KIPP back then, 20 years ago, it is today, is very simply, there are no shortcuts. If we're going to try to provide children with all the academic, intellectual, and character skills they need to do well, not just in that grade level, but in all facets of K-12, college, and the competitive world beyond, then quit looking for the magic bullet. Let's just roll up our sleeves and get after it. And so we started the Knowledge is Power program, thinking, what can we do as fifth grade teachers they everybody decided we were going to motivate kids to go to school from 7.30 to 5, four hours on Saturdays, half the summer, two hours of homework a night. And we quickly realized one year wasn't enough, and so that's when we turned it into a school, and now it's become a network of schools. Got it. I'll, I'll come back a little bit to, 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 to the nature of the program. But uh, sticking for, uh, for now to the, the way you built KIPP, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in the beginning, and how did you overcome them? The biggest challenge by far in the early years remains the biggest challenge today, which is on any given day, in any given hour, in any given class period, with any given student, teaching and learning is extremely difficult. It's, everyone thinks that they know how to do it well because we've all got 13, 14, 15 years of experience in K-12, but actually being in front of a group of children and, and and imparting knowledge for, from your brain heart into the brain heart of a 5, 10, or 15-year-old is an extremely difficult both art and science to do. Now, that, and to do it at a high level is the most difficult part about this. The, the other most difficult part is simply getting people to believe. Having, putting forth an idea for a program and then a school that's going to en masse help underserved children succeed in school and life at the highest levels of society, most people think you have two heads when you first say that. Now, we've come a long way since the early 90s, and more people believe today than did 20 years ago. But collectively, we don't yet believe as a society um, that the achievement gap is something that we can overcome. And that's what we are trying to demonstrate and prove every single day that it can. Let's go back to talking about the basic structure of the program, uh, the no shortcuts approach. Uh, is this something that you started with, or is this something that evolved over time? And how is your, your, the, the basic... Uh, structure of, of KIPP, uh, the, the KIPP education model evolved over the past 20 years. Right. Uh, the basic structure is still in place. I think, I think the, the most innovative part of KIPP over the years is that we didn't try to be innovative. 
We just tried to block and tackle really well. We focused early on uh, ourselves on just what could we do to become great teachers. And to this day, that, that's the focus is, is great, great teaching. Um, any school in the, in the world that's doing a great job, I'd argue, has two basic ingredients. It's great teaching and more of it. That's simple. Now, easy to say, hard to do, but it's a simple formula. And if there's any secret sauce, it's how do you create the culture that's such a great positive culture that allows great teaching and more of it to happen. But that basic structure of longer school day, week, and year, and focus on great teaching and learning, and having a culture of high expectations, and focusing on not just inputs, but the ultimate output, which is getting our kids to go to and through college, and have the freedom to do this world what they want to do, those things were put in place from the very beginning, and, and we're, we're focused on executing on those things day in and day out. The last thing I think I'd say that is there from the beginning is our, our core beliefs. And I think one of our most central core beliefs is that promises to children are sacred. Because KIPP is a choice public school, we, we sit in living rooms and kitchen tables talking to kids and parents, saying if you choose to come to KIPP, we will do whatever it takes to help you come to, we will, we'll do whatever it takes to help you get to and through college. That, that's a pretty bold promise, because we're, we're not talking about what we're going to do for that kid and family next week, next month, next year, sometimes not even next decade. We're promising what's going to happen in 20 years in some cases. And we're on the hook. And that is something that w we feel more accountable for, to that sacred promise than any accountability plan any state or federal government can lay on us. And I think that that's what gets us out of the bed in the morning, and that's what motivates us to, to do right by our kids and parents in our communities. Do the kids and the pro uh, parents also make a similar promise? And, and, and uh, so is, is, is your approach to select the most highly motivated uh, kids and parents? Oh, we don't select our kids and parents, they select us. Uh, it's, a, it's a public open enrollment school, which means anyone can, can come. If, there's, if more kids and parents want to come in space available, we have to go to a lottery. And the only kids who don't have to be in a lottery are the younger brothers and sisters. So we do not get to do any kind of selection. We just are a public school of, of choice. And whoever wants to come, we, it, we, are, we are on the hook with that sacred promise to deliver and help them learn everything they need to learn to be set up for success in school and life. So you serve about 50,000 students right now mm -hmm. across the 141 schools that are part of your network. How many students apply uh, to become part of KIPP and, uh, and, and how many are you it, able to admit? It varies region to region. Where, where I am in, in Houston, where we now have 22 schools and 11,000 kids, last year we had nearly 10,000 kids and parents apply to come to KIPP. We had room for 2,000, mm -hmm. so we had a very... Uh, difficult lottery where we're yeah. saying sorry no room to 80 percent of all the kids and parents who want to come which th that's one of the things I, the thing that I wake up in the middle of the night kicking and screaming having nightmares about are how are we going to keep our sacred promise to the kids we're serving and when I'm not having a nightmare about that the other thing that's making me wake up at night are how are we going to continue to grow to serve those other thousands of kids and parents who are looking for another option and we're not able to deliver yet so we're trying to grow as fast as we can but as slow as we must to maintain quality. Great. Well, that's, that's a great approach, I think. Uh, balancing growth and, and not compromising on quality uh -huh. uh, is, is, is really tough, but yeah. I'm glad I mean, you're it, straddling that. There, there's people that are amazed about our growth and how big we've gotten, and we are very proud of having this high-performing network of 141 schools and 50,000 kids. But remember, it, it, we're about to celebrate our 20th anniversary right. in 2014. There was no growth for the first six years, right? And so, and then when we started growing, we, the first thing we did, we put in, in place a terrific school leadership training program with just a few Fisher Fellows, our school leaders we were training. And over the last two decades, now decade and a half, we ramped it up to now we can be growing at 15 or 20 schools a year. But this did not happen overnight nor did it even happen in a decade. It's taken 20 years to, to grow this way. So this is, this is just slow and steady progress, keeping a commitment, staying on track, and just executing day in and day out on a strategy. So uh, you, you mentioned that for the first six years, it was kind of not much growth. And then at the sixth year, there was a, a jump start. Was that the year when you partnered with uh, uh, the Fishers uh, yes. at, at, at Gap, so, uh, the found, founders of Gap. Right. So, uh, uh, how did that yeah, uh, so, come about? So KIPP started the program, and we had a chance to start it as a school both in Houston and then in New York City. 
Right. Dave Levin's from New York City, so he went. We, we had both offers, and being young and dumb, we took both offers. So Dave started Kip Academy in the Bronx. I stayed in Houston and started Kip Academy there, both with fifth grade. We grew it one year at a time. Our heads were down. We were focused on our kids and delivering on sacred promises. By 1999, they be, our two schools became full-size fifth grade through eighth grade charter schools. Uh, they, were, they were some of the highest performing schools in their respective communities of Houston and New York City. People started visiting. 60 Minutes did a piece on our kids that opened up the floodgates. We had people calling saying, we saw that program on TV. Can we order 15 kips for next year, please? And we, <laughs> we were saying, let's go check inventory. Um, and believing in Teach for America and the mission of Teach for America of one day all children should get a great education. We start thinking, so how do we leverage the success of this little tiny school in Southwest Houston and this little tiny school in the South Bronx, New York, to the greater good? So we start asking people for help and advice on how to scale ideas and, and, and scale success. And we, we were fortunate enough to, to get in touch with Don Doris Fisher, the founders of, of the Gapital Navy, that were very focused and passionate about ed reform in the United States. And it was a, it was a terrific match, and, and we created a new foundation together called KIPP Foundation. I want to call it the No Shortcuts Foundation, but Don- Is knew, it a nonprofit? Yeah, nonprofit. Don, Don knew more about brand names than me. He said, mm -hmm. call it KIPP, and we said, yes, sir. <laughs> and so we started KIPP Foundation in April of 2000 mm -hmm. with the goal of finding amazing teachers who have a fire in the belly to do this work beyond the four walls of their classroom. We would train them for a year in this fellowship, the Fisher Fellowship, to, have the, to get the business and leadership skills to complement their terrific instructional skills. And from there, help them start the school of their dreams. And that's how we've been growing as we have for the past 13 years. Uh, you, you've mentioned a couple of times the importance of passionate teachers. Uh, what, do you, what do you think makes a great teacher, and how do you identify yeah. the teachers who are the best fit for KIPP? I think there are four things that make a teacher a great teacher. First and foremost, it's a teacher that's, that has a lot of knowledge and passion in the subject, the subject matter they're teaching. Um, they don't need to rely on the teacher's addition to teach. They can bring a wealth of outside resource in the classroom and make the learning come alive. And if they love history, the kids will love history. Right. Second, the teacher knows how to take all that knowledge and passion from their brain and heart and transfer it into the brain and, ha brain and heart of a 5, 10, or 15-year-old, which for some people is a gift. For most of us mortals, that's a skill which has to be acquired over several years to learn how to do that really well. Third, we're looking for teachers who have the basic attitude of doing whatever it takes, that they're, they're, they're going to be the constant, not the variable. And even though kids, especially in, for, from underserved communities, come to school with lots of variables and lots of potential excuses why learning is difficult, the teachers will try to be the constant, not the variable, for as much as possible. And lastly, to, to avoid uh, being the example of the, the, the sports team that has the loaded with talent but never wins the championship, you also have to have to have teachers that buy into the basic core beliefs and values of that school. Right? It, it's, it's possible to be a terrific teacher, as I named, but still not fit with the rest of the faculty. And we need people who are going to be good teammates, not just in their classrooms, but in the teacher's lounge, in the locker room as well. Right. Um, now, so, so, so you partnered with uh, uh, the, the Fishers to, to launch, to create the KIPP Foundation. You took KIPP National. Uh, what challenges did you face in scaling things up, and how did you overcome them? And what lessons did you learn? Yeah. Uh, f you know, for us, if, if great teaching and more of it are the ingredients of a great school, the critical path is a great school leader, because that great the principal, the principal or the school leader, is going to be the one who's going to recruit the great teachers, develop the great teachers, retain the great teachers, motivate the great teachers, and so for us, the ch most challenging part has been to recruit and select those amazing, terrific leaders. Uh, we've had, in the last 13 years, we've had over 5,000 people apply for the Fisher Fellowship. We've given out about 190 fellowships. About 30 people didn't make it through the fellowship. So we're batting about a 2 to 3% acceptance rate. Um, so and, and it, God bless the Fisher family and, and many other funders who, who've, been, who've been making this possible. That's not a quota. That's how many people we, we've been able to successfully find to do this work. And uh, it's getting relatively easier as, as we've created this large footprint of schools. More and more of our Fisher Fellows are, are our teachers who are developing over time through the, the leadership pipeline. But finding these talented, terrific school leaders and then keeping them 
uh, because you know, running a school, th these are like dog years, right? So it, 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 it really, you know, I had a ponytail when I started. Um, <laughs> so we, so it, it, it takes really just commitment and skill and hard work and tenacity. And so finding these people and keeping them is, is the biggest challenge. Uh, I have a question about your students, and this is based on some discussions I've had with people in other countries who are trying to do similar work uh, as you are doing here. Uh, one of the things they've found is that uh, although they may have a great program uh, that, that educates the kids in school, uh, when the children go back to the social and family environment, uh, uh, sometimes it has the effect of undoing some of the good that has happened in school. Uh, I wonder if you have ever faced that challenge and, and uh, have you ever, how, how, how you have dealt with it? We have families, and uh, we form great relationships with all of our families as part of this work. We're partners with 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 our families, um, and there are examples where the parents or grandparents almost feel threatened by their their child or grandchild suddenly learning more about the world than they have. But that I would say is is more the exception to the rule. Just about every home I've been in, and I've been over a thousand homes. Families are hungry for their children to to live the American dream, and now that we're doing international work as well, and we're in, we're we're helping educators start these Kip Inspire schools in India and South Africa, and Israel and Chile and Mexico, I realize that the American dream is really a global dream. Oh, it's that's interesting. It's hard to find parents who don't want their children to have a better life than them, and they and parents. De deliberately realize or it simply instinctly realize that education is a ticket for their kids to have a better life. Right. Uh, I'm very fascinated by your overseas expansion. Can you tell me a little more uh, about what were the challenges involved there? Sure. Uh, f for a bunch of years, we've always had uh, international educators knock on our door and ask for help. And that traffic has increased in the last four or five years. It's I think it's due to the, the growth of, of, as Teach for America has become Teach for All, and Teach for All is now in two dozen countries, more and more of the alumni, they finish their two years. Uh, you know, half of them want to go to grad school or Goldman or McKinsey. The other half want to stay in the classroom and stay in their schools and make a difference. And they wind up knocking on our door. And for a few years, we, we, when they first at, came and asked us for help, and they would come and see what we were doing and say, can you come to our country? Our answer was always, sorry. We haven't even fixed the state of Arkansas yet. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> right. Here, um, I like to give more hope. So I, I told people, look, we, we can help you the way we help ourselves. We, we focus on leadership training. And if you have the skills or passion or you know someone in your country has got the skills and passion and there's resources to get them to the United States, come over here. I'll sneak them in the side door of the Fisher Fellowship. We'll train them in leadership with our Fisher Fellows, have them stay in the U.S. for a few months. They can beg, borrow, and steal all the great ideas because we, we don't believe in intellectual property. We give it away, mm -hmm. you know, one, one day all children. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll go back to the, their country, start a great school. It won't be a KIPP school, but it'll be a KIPP-inspired school. And they'll be part of our network, and they'll have this cohort with the KIPP school leaders, and we'll learn and grow together. Um, we didn't market it. We just put the bait in the water. And the Israelis for the first country to take me up on it. Then, then came the Indians. Um, then came the Mexicans. Uh, then the South Africans, and most lately the Chileans. Um, and we're, you know, we we spun off a new nonprofit called the One World Network of Schools, because uh, there's such a growing line at the door. So now when people knock on Kip's door, we refer them to One World, and the One World Network of Schools will help both do the do the training, support on the back end, help people start these schools, and most importantly, you know, if we're if this is going to grow, when people first knock on our door, they think they want to replicate Kip. What they really want to replicate is the Kip School Leadership Program. I mean, you know, my, my Indian friends don't talk about wanting to start dozens or hundreds of schools. They need thousands, right? There's a little bit of a scale issue in India, <laughs> right? And so what they, they don't have enough philanthropy, and we don't have enough seats to train everyone in the United States. So ultimately, what we have to replicate is the Kip School Leadership Program so there's an in-country place for teachers to get trained to start these breakthrough, new, transformative schools in-country. That's how you can scale this. It's fascinating. Uh, how do you measure KIPP's success? Uh, we, ult the ultimate outcome is did we deliver on our sacred promises to our children? So have they, did they get to and through college and now have the freedom to do in this world what they want to do? And so tracking from eighth grade, which we do to be more transparent, because I could tell you 
100% of my kids are going to college if I look at my class of 2013, but that's not, those are not the same kids we started with. So if I look at my eighth graders from a bunch of years ago and wherever they went to high school, uh, we track them all, uh, nine, 85 to 90 percent are going to college. And so far, depending on the region, 45 to 48 percent have graduated from college. And we, we think about that in two ways. You know, compared to 8 percent of low-income kids who gra graduate from college, we're five or six times the national average. We celebrate that. Compared to 31 percent of all adults in the United States who have a college degree, we're a lot higher than that. We celebrate that. Compared to 82 percent of top quartile income kids who graduate from college, we're still well below that number. So we still have an achievement gap, and we are hungry to get better every day. So what, what are the main obstacles to closing that achievement gap, and how are you tackling them? Uh, several things. First off is just continued uh, rigor in pre-K through 12th grade and getting the kids set up for academic success to be ready for, for college work and not need any remediation. Uh, those numbers I gave you were all kids that we started with in fifth grade, in a lot of cases didn't even have a high school and ended after eighth grade. We've since started primary schools. Those oldest kids are now in eighth grade, so starting in 2018, we should see the benefits of starting kids even younger. But that, that's, that's part of it, so it's the academic rigor. Uh, secondly, it, it's, there's certainly financial issues, both, both direct and indirect. Direct is the cost of higher education is going through the roof, and it's difficult to afford. Indirect, how, how, how do you deal with that? <laughs> help, help our kids just apply to lots and lots of scholarships and maximize financial aid as much as possible and also deal with the families because the indirect challenges with, with, with finances are parents are sometimes pushing their kids to, to stop school and come back home and take an $8 an hour job to help the family pay rent. Or that kid to, to make tuition payments is working 40 hours a week in, in the mall, which means that's 40 hours a week they're not studying in the library, so their grades suffer, so, so their financial aid package goes down as a vicious circle. That's the financial bucket. There is, there's horrible college counseling in this country, if it exists at all in some schools, where kids who should be staying close to home go far away, kids who should go to a small school go to a big school, kids that get into two schools, um, they're, they're not given the data. This school, this, they're both equally hard to get into schools, same financial aid package. This school's got a 62% completion rate. This school's got a 28% completion rate. Why won't you choose this school where you double your chances of finishing just by going with the flow? Right, things like that. Fourth are just all the challenges of being a first generation low income kid. You can't call home and you, can't, you don't have a lifeline to get advice on how to climb the mountain to and through college. And lastly are the non-cognitive skills, which are being pioneered and studied here at the University of Pennsylvania by Martin Seligman and Angela Duckworth about you know people are not gonna graduate from college only because they can read, write, and think critically. They also need grit, they need self-control, they need optimism. Right? They, they, need, they need zest, they need, and no one's born with those things. They, they develop them over the years. And so those are all the big buckets we have to work on, both on the K-12 side and on higher ed side, because higher ed has a responsibility in this as well. And it's fantastic to see the University of Pennsylvania be a leader on the higher ed side of community about making sure that we close the achievement gap and our first generation low-income kids in this country graduate at the exact same rate as all of our other kids. Uh, well, uh, uh, th th thank you for what you said about UPenn, uh, but especially when it comes to funding their college education, uh, does your curriculum emphasize things like um, uh, awareness of personal uh, finance or financial literacy or entrepreneurship or leadership to some degree? Or do you think that might through, help? Again, be, because we're focused on getting our kids to go to and through college and not just pass the state test, our KIPP through college team starts in middle school with teaching kids about what it's gonna to take to be pre prepared and set for success in college and life. And so certainly uh, leadership and personal finance and entrepreneurship are all part of that that we need to develop in our kids. You know, we, my, my favorite shirt in the KIPP team and family is KIPP New York City has a shirt that shows the pie chart of the ingredients of KIPP. And it says 49% academics, 51% character, right? And so, uh, and I, those numbers we're choosing very deliberately. There's a lot beyond traditional tested subjects that we need to give our kids to set them up for success. Okay. And I have one last question for you. Where would you like KIPP to be on its 25th birthday? And huh. what can we do to help you get there? Huh. Uh, by our 20, I, I would love to be able to say that we, we, are, we are knocking on the door of closing the achievement gap. 
and we're not just trying to get up to 50% of our kids going to and through college, but we, we've, we've blown past 60%, we're getting close to 70%, and we are proving the possible, and by us doing so, we've inspired our friends to do as well, and the, and the, the excuses are ending, because the day the excuses end, our days of solutions are going to start. And as a result, I would love to see that our 8,000 kid wait list in Houston shrink with, without, us, without us maintaining quality, and it shrunk because the other schools have gotten better, so the kids and parents stop want to come. That's what I'm hoping to get to by 25th would be fantastic. And anything we can do to help you get there? Yeah, definitely. You can, a uh, few things. First off, uh, Penn has been a leader on, on, on the most competitive higher ed side and the Ivy League side of, of, of helping, whether it's KIPP kids and other kids from high performing schools in low-income neighborhoods come here and succeed here. That proves it possible right then and there. And having more and more kids come here and be successful helps get more believers to believe in the potential of all of our children, and that's huge. Secondly, uh, the, the things that the university can, can be doing to partner with K-12 and give feedback down to us of where are the holes. What still are our, our kids not doing well on day one that we could fix in 12th grade, 10th grade, 8th grade, 4th grade, pre-K to get them set for more success? And lastly, it's about great teaching and more of it. So having the, the terrific faculty here at Penn continue to help teachers sharpen the saw and develop the, the, the teaching skills and the content skills they need to be great teachers is also a, a fantastic resource the university can, has been doing and, and I hope does more of in the future. Great. Well, Mike, uh, good luck to you and uh, thank you very much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you for having me here. Go Quakers.